Hello, friends of human spaceflight. Coming up, we're gonna be... That's gonna have to change. Uh... <sighs> Finally free of that guy. Coming up, we're gonna be talking about the Human Landing System program. Specifically, the latest revelation about the number of HLS providers. Now we have... Player <laughs> What went wrong here? Wasn't SpaceX's lunar starship enough? Let's talk about this proposed second human landing system and how this will affect the return of humanity to the moon. What do you think will be picked as the second option? As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. Do we even need a second option when we have SpaceX's lunar starship? Does hearing this make you happy? Are we happy? Vincent? Yeah, we happy. Whilst we're at it, no episode of To The Future would be complete without some kind of rant about something, so keep your eyes and ears peeled for that later on. Psst. Hey, come here, come here. It's about the Artemis White Dress rehearsal. Didn't you just, like, snap yourself out of existence, like, two seconds ago? Nah, man, the editor just used some cool effects. <laughs> And as if that wasn't enough for you, let's round the episode off with the latest escapades happening down at Boca Chica. As always, we have a lot to talk about in this episode, so stay tuned. Recently this month, NASA dropped a nice little report called the Lunar Surface Sustainability Concept. In this concept, NASA outlined how they want a second contractor for the HLS program. We already know that SpaceX was chosen as the first and sole contractor from the initial HLS bid. You were the chosen one! Lifting the cover on this report by NASA, we see in Next Step Appendix P, NASA describing HLS sustaining lunar development. As you can see here, this project supports sustaining the presence of humans on the lunar surface in the Artemis program. Starting with the first surface expedition, we can already see a small change. Lunar Gateway will not be part of the Artemis 3 mission. Owing to the advancement of technology over the years and more advanced capabilities in lunar mobility, we now see the plan targets the construction and installation of a lunar surface habitat, right here. Coming back to the current state of the HLS initiative, the first phase of initial development is now closed. Now the full development and demonstration phase is next step on the agenda. SpaceX's lunar lander is for sure going to be a fixed feature here. Let's talk about the second HLS option. What do we know? In the initial solicitation document, we can see the line, the purpose of this solicitation is to request proposals from industry for selection and award for the rapid development and demonstration of a sustainable human landing system from a second provider, delivering humans to the lunar surface in a subsequent Artemis mission and with the goal of doing so by July 2027. It goes without saying that SpaceX is excluded from this solicitation. Could you imagine? Breaking news, just in, SpaceX wins HLS round two. Bezos to sue the Borg Collective for altering the timeline. NASA holds a press conference with the winners. Elon to congratulate Elon for a job well done. All joking aside, Let's see what NASA put on their wish list for the second HLS contractor. We can see a few familiar key goals here we've seen before. Design development, testing of the lander, confirming docking capability with Gateway and Orion. You know, it'd be pretty awkward if we got all the way up into lunar orbit only to have a square peg round hole problem. Oh, and also the lander has to be able to land on the moon at the South Pole, delivering both crew and cargo. The crew need to be able to exit the lander and go outside for a nice walk and some fresh vacuum on the lunar surface. Don't forget EVA suits, folks. And last but not least, the lander needs to be able to return the crew and any collected samples up to lunar orbit, where it will initially rendezvous with Orion, with a future option of a lunar gateway rendezvous. Can you do that? No, I'm afraid- Let's not rush into any hasty answers, Anderson. Uh, the task has been set and needs to be carried out. At the end of the day, you are an expert. Having a fixed price from the contract's outset is a great idea to safeguard taxpayers' money. Not only this, but introducing the idea of payments being paid when the developer reaches certain milestones also ensures that everything remains within scope and on budget. Sounds like some people are starting to learn some lessons here, huh? 
The ball has already begun rolling on this process with the request for information that was published on the 31st of March this year. And the process should end with the awarding of the contract to the winner on the 31st of January next year. Cool, 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 no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. So who are the players for the second round? On the 4th of April, NASA organized an industry forum and it just so happens that the guest list is public. No surprise here, the national team's three amigos are present. Throwing the respective hats into the ring again, Taurus is cooler by the way, just saying. Made up of Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Blue Origin, these three are going to have an advantage having had a product already designed previously. Speaking of previously designed hardware, we can also see Dynetics in this list too. Others that appear include Latus, Draper Laboratory, Paragon Space Development, and Collins Aerospace. So of course, the expectation is for the previous round's applicants to reapply again. Let's just hope we don't end up in a massive legal brawl all over again this time. Not looking at anyone in particular. In terms of how these future HLS applicants will get to space in the first place, here we only have the ghosts of rockets yet to be built. Dynetics would likely take a wild rodeo up on a Vulcan Centaur. However, just in the last few days, ULA finally received their first set of flight-ready BE-4s, which should already be heading to the built stand, and thanks to our very own Zabulch, we know that the Vulcan launch is now expected to be later this year. Hey, some news! The national team system, the descent, the ascent, and the transfer element would be launched on top of the also yet to be built New Glen. Based on what little we know, the Centaur seems to be much closer to completion than the New Glen. Though we have seen some photos before today on the latter. So in this latest NASA document, Check out this sentence right here. While NASA intends to exclude SpaceX from being a prime contractor under the SLD procurement, SpaceX may otherwise participate, for example, as a launch provider on another offerer's team. Huh, so what do you know? We might end up seeing starships having more tasks in the Artemis project, besides the Lunar Starship variant being just a moon taxi. All the launch vehicles that are tabled on this solicitation have to be commercial ones, as stated right here. They also have to either be certified under NASA launch services, or have three successful launches, or be the launch service version of the SLS itself. No idea how that last option is a commercial one, but considering the cost per launch, no that. Let's stop and noodle around a bit for what a second HLS provider could mean overall. Over here, the more rockets, spaceships, and landers we can see launching, or we like it. Except for those ICBMs, probably not those. We are space nerds after all. A little snag we might see along the way could be a funding issue. After all, this second option is being funded through development and construction and testing from the NASA budget. That's taxpayers' dollars. So getting that through Congress could be a tricky one. So is the second HLS lander really lowering the risks in the Artemis project as intended? Or is it just another opportunity for some companies to rake in some of that dollar dollar bill? At the very least, we could see some serious thought on affordability in this solicitation. Here, offerer HLS bids will be assessed based on various metrics, such as dollars per kilogram of down mass to the lunar surface from near rectilinear halo orbit, dollars per utile crew EVA hour, dollar per crew member on lunar surface, and lastly, cadence-related metrics such as lead times, times between repeat missions, and various missing constraints. If you want to dig further into this, we'll leave a link in the description below. So enough about the solicitation. Let's look to more recent events, specifically the Artemis 1 mission. Well, that wet dress rehearsal didn't go so well, huh? Initially, there seemed to be some problems getting the SLS out of the VAB in the first place. An issue with the Mobile Launcher 1 crawler platform, a fault with the launch tower, And a faulty fan system and overpressure valve in the ground support infrastructure saw the WDR get pushed back to the 9th of April. Another reason for the pushback here was to allow for the launch of Axum 1 crewed mission, which also ascended from the Cape. Once this had passed and testing had resumed on the SLS, another issue surfaced. This time in the form of a helium check valve in the interim cryogenic upper stage, not functioning as expected. This caused another delay with the test and ended up altering the plan for the WDR 2. The altered scope for the WDR would include the filling of the SLS core stage and only a minimal fuel test on the interim cryogenic upper stage to account for the faulty valve. Fast forward to April 14th, during this reduced scope wet dress rehearsal, NASA found a leak on the tail of the service mast umbilical. The ground support equipment loads hydrogen through these umbilicals into the SLS rocket itself, connected to the base of the core stage. So even running the test at the reduced scope, NASA had to pull the plug. 
So by the time you're watching this video, the SLS will have been rolled back to the VAB so that the engineers can fix these various issues that have arisen during the SLS test campaign so far. After those repairs are complete, NASA will likely go with one of two options. Option one, after the repair works are successfully carried out, the flight abort system will be brought online and SLS will be rolled out to pad 39B. Hopefully, after a successful wet dress rehearsal, the Artemis one will be then launched. Option number two, the SLS will be rolled to pad 39B. Another wet dress rehearsal will take place. Roll the rocket back into the VAB, arm the flight abort system, and then roll it back out for the Artemis 1 mission launch. NASA isn't setting a launch date for Artemis 1 until the wet dress rehearsal tests are completed. But even then, it's looking like the first SLS launch isn't going to happen before the end of June, it seems, with fallback dates ranging from the late July all the way through to early August. This story reminds us that valves are finicky little creatures. Point in case, the OFT2 campaign of the Boeing Starliner of August last year. During their standard checkups prior to launch, they found that 13 out of the 24 oxidizer valves had gotten stuck. That isn't the end of Boeing's story on Starliner though. The game plan for the next attempt of the OFT2 test campaign is currently scheduled for the 19th of May this year with a newly built service module. Vote now in the comments which one you think will fly first. SLS with its WDR, Starliner with their Valve and software issues, or Starship VFAA round 396. Let's see what you all think out there. Wondering what to do next? Why not smash those buttons down there below me? Leave a like, consider subscribing if you aren't already, and if you saw something that you just have to show your space nerd friend in here, no worries, the share button got you covered. Hope you all have a nice day. See you in the next episode. Till then, it's on to the future. Schumann's Lunar Spearship. We're going to be talking about safety first, kids. Soft landing spell.